First, I'd like to ask your permission, since we're at least 12 feet away, for, to take this off so you can hear me. Uh, I've been double vaccinated with all the shots, so I think everything is cool. And I hope that all you stay safe and happy and are able to avoid this mess that uh, is out there we call the pandemic, I guess. Uh, yeah, I need to thank Andre, I mean, to this guy. Does this guy work or what? I mean, you know what I mean? Yes. Um, and all the staff and patrons of the East Hawaii Cultural Center. Uh, this is a, a true jewel on the island, I think. And it's uh, great to have a place where contemporary art is recognized and, uh, and uh, we, people can have a dialogue about it. Um, I came to Hawaii in the 90s, 80s actually, doing a workshop uh, at, the, uh, at the University of Hawaii in, uh, in Honolulu and uh, met the Twigsmiths there, Lila Twigsmith and, uh, and some other people, Susan Wolf, and uh, basically that's my first connection with Hawaii. Then I started coming to Hawaii in the 80s. and. Uh, bought a house in the early 90s and uh, probably will move here permanently in the next year or so. And so we're really excited about doing that. We feel very uh, good about the islands and the place where it is. And uh, so we look forward to seeing you all. A lot of you here are, my, are, good, are great friends. Uh, the, everybody here, I hope, will be a friend. And I wanna thank you for coming. It's, it's really nice to see faces. It's been a year since I've seen faces like this. I mean, for most of us, it's been that long, you know, to have any kind of a social gathering. Uh, and this, this is pretty amazing. So thank you very much. And I'd like to thank my wife, Kathy, right there. Yeah. She's, she's always been supportive and helpful and always keeps me on the right path. Turn here. No, go there. <laughs> anyway, she knows how to, she knows she's a great help. Uh, when Andre asked me to do this show, I said, oh great, I'll do a Hawaii show. So I, so I thought, well, I do these animals out of shoes, but what animals are in Hawaii? And I thought, fish and turtles and oh, my, my pigs, there's pigs in Hawaii chickens, uh, rabbits, you know, but I was doing bears and javelinas and, you know, deer and stuff like that. And I thought, well, I'll try to make it just a Hawaiian show. So I made a whole bunch of these pigs and javelinas. Andre saw the show and said, this is too Hawaii. We, do, we want you, not, not Hawaii. And I said, okay. And so I worked on the other pieces, uh, which fit in with the the things. I originally started the shoe pieces. Um, I just kind of, I, I, my studio practice is really about working and finding something in the studio that starts to talk to me. And when it starts to talk to me, I listen and respond and it talks back. And this is one of the things that I <clears throat> taught my students for years. You've got to work on it till it talks back to you. When it talks back to you, you know what's going on. You, you may not know what to do right away, but that's what you need is this dialogue with this inanimate stuff that says, I'm too blue, or I need to be bigger, or, you know, I don't want to be a rabbit, you know, whatever. And so um, I, I respond to those things, and, but, I, but I, am, I do have a master of fine arts. I am a doctorate in the field, and I have the knowledge of art history and all that baloney, uh, you know, to back it up. But the thing that really powers my studio practice is a kinesthetic response to the world. Or, and, and that basically is where all your senses get mixed up into, into one thing. In other words, you see a color, but you feel a temperature, or you uh, hear a pattern and it comes up with a, a series of forms that you see. 
the things transfer from your sense of sight to your sense of smell to your sense of uh, taste to your sense of hearing and they all sort of work together. This started for me when I was a very young boy uh, in my grandparents' backyard in West Texas and the locusts were in the trees and the trees were going like this in that West Texas wind and the locusts were going oh, 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 oh. and I was going you know, it just was the whole world. It, was, it wasn't just looking at something, it was being in it. So I really tried to make the pieces so that you are in them. You know, you, when you see them, they, they just, they uh, sort of dematerialize and, and become this kinetic energy that hopefully you can uh, perceive the tune or the song or the message as it may be. I was a ceramicist for many years and then became a sort of collage sculptor in that I, in the, in the 80s, late 80s, early 90s, I started, uh, I got really tired of being, every show that I was in either, either, either just had in the title either mud <laughs> or dirt or clay, you know, I said, I want to be in an art show, not a, not a super clay mud show, I want to be in an art show. And so I started approaching sculpture, but I had never taken a sculpture class in college, uh, not in graduate school, not in undergraduate school. And uh, so I didn't know what I was doing. And so I started putting stuff together and making uh, these uh, collages out of the junk that I found in secondhand stores in Missoula, Montana. And one day I came upon a deer head. Missoula was a very hunter's place. Every fall, regularly, people would pull up you on, but, and at the light, and they'd have a deer on their fender, you know, dead, that they had just shot, and just going like that. And you're looking at it, uh, you know, in your car. And so <clears throat> I found this uh, deer trophy in a secondhand store, my favorite secondhand store, Wolf's. And somebody had shot this deer and then mounted it, and then left it outside and the nose had rotten off and they'd, the eyes were out and, you know, and the, one of the horns was broken and it was, or they'd cut it off and made it a keychain or something. And I thought, well, that's really a bad deal, you know, to do something like this and then not honor it, you know, not do something with it. So I took it home and I started working on it. And then of course, with my cracked up sense of humor, I, the first thing I did is I sheathed the thing in lucky beer cans because that's the beer that they drank while they hunted the deer. <laughs> you know? So I gave them an armor of lucky beer cans. And then I took some plastic wood and I rebuilt the eyes and I painted them to be my eyes, blue eyes. And then uh, the nose, I was looking at the nose and I thought, okay, well, so I took this, sh took this shoe and I cut off the, the, the toe and I put it on the nose and I went, oh shit, you know, I'm putting the animal skin back where it was. You know, this is now, this is like Frankenstein. You know, I'm rebuilding something out of the dead parts of this other animal. Of course, it was a cow. It wasn't a deer shoe, but, you know, I was putting leather back on the animal. And so I started building these pieces. And, uh, and to me, they were, uh, like I say, they were Frankensteinish and grotesque and kind of scary. But everybody that looked at them went, hey, that's really cool. I'd love to see that out in the woods, wouldn't you? And I was like, no, <laughs> I really wouldn't like to see that out in the woods. But I became, after a while, acclimatized to the humor and the irony of the whole thing and decided that I was really making portraits of people more than I was making animals because <clears throat> the shoes and the uh, belts and the cords all referred to our experiences of what we've seen and known, either what we've worn or what a friend of ours has worn in school or at a, at a wedding or whatever, you know, I mean, it, so they, they came with memories. They're all used shoes, they're not new shoes, so they do come with a history. They came with a history of the people that were, was in them. And I've worked on these since, since the uh, late, late 70s, 80s, and then off and on, I, I've done other things too, like the uh, bronze pieces, which were uh, another segue into something else.
But the, uh, this basically, it developed to these so that now they involve a lot of Hawaiian elements. There's Hawaiian shirts and belts and ties. And I'm not trying to make them Hawaiian. That's just part of my experience. I wear Hawaiian shirts and I used to wear jeans and I didn't wear high heels. Well, a couple times, but <laughs> Kathy and I know about that, but no. <laughs> uh, so basically, um, these are kind of the synthesis of those, of those experiences. Uh, I was originally a painter. So there's a lot of painting in these, uh, a lot of color, uh, a lot of bounce back and forth in that almost that same way you decorate a ceramic piece where you start with a three-dimensional form and then you start putting stuff on it, taking stuff off of it. Um, so it's, you know, they create this sort of, oh, it, 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 to me, it, I like to say that I tune them rather than I, than I, than I compose them because I hear them. And I can hear them now. Hey, that's all right. Don't worry about it. It's okay. I was, I was going to make a joke about that, and I thought, oh, that's not a good idea. So anyway, uh, I feel very privileged to have made this show for the, for the East Hawaiian Cultural Center. The particular pieces that I had made originally involved uh, a lot of these things, which were uh, sort of my take on the petroglyphs, you know, that are around... Um, Hawaii, and and they are uh, again not not trying to be Hawaiian, but trying to be Hawaiian in the in traditional sense, but Hawaiian in the modern sense with what it is, with all these layers of different cultures that have come here and intermixed and or conflicted uh, to be what we are today. Um, that's probably enough for me to say, if you have a question. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Laura. Yeah, uh, because Andre is recording this, I'm supposed to kind of repeat the question. So basically, the question is... Can you come closer? This, what role does this sort of consume? If you come closer, he's going to record the microphone. <laughs> okay, I, so just looking at the surface of these, right. consumerism and excess. Right, yes. All these Yes. Play a big part of that. Right. So I'm sort of maybe pointing you back at the surface of the pieces, but what part did that notion play in your process of creating these? Well, <clears throat> of course, you don't see them now, but when I have them in the studio and they're these bare skins, they're a lot like those bronze masks back there. You know, they're, they're, they're kind of just shells of this form, and there's not much going on on them. And uh, when I start to work with the patterns, as I said, as if, as if they're uh, tonal patterns that work on the piece, then I try to layer it so that eventually, this, this might sound kind of funny, but I try to layer it so it doesn't look like a kit anymore, you know? Because <laughs> usually a taxidermist mount looks like a kit, you know? And, and you have your glass eyes and you have everything you gotta get. Well, I don't want them to look like that at all. You know, I want to be able to use the form and then have it be this sort of, uh, uh, it's not a cinematic experience because it's sculpture, but it's, but it's also not a traditional sculpture experience because you're not just looking at the profile and the proportions and the balance of lights and darks. There's, they're very noisy, as you, as you said. And I like that kind of noise, uh, the, the only, 
problem with it is tuning it so that it so that it's just not a bunch of noise and and that's in fact that one right there that pink one over there was the one i had have had the most problem with and it's still not quite tuned <laughs> i'm still you know it might have another layer that might happen on it because it's basically and i can't explain it because i don't you know i want them to end up being at a place that i can't explain in other words it's a place i've never been and and uh, and these i don't have to do anything to that one i still might have to do something to um, that's a little secret. You guys shouldn't have known that because that, <laughs> you know, artists are not supposed to do that. But that's what happens with any artwork, any artist that I know. You know, you do a show, you put it up. Six weeks later, you think, two of those paintings weren't that good. You know, that's the best one. And so they take on a life after you bring them into the world. And they either live and eventually go into sort of a semi-sleep where they become artifacts but they don't have a voice anymore you know and so i try to push them as hard as i can to get the voice here and get the voice that will stay as long as i can make it stay there's no way that they're going to stay for 50 years i mean it's just hardly ever happens you know i mean that's a masterpiece that would happen like that and that usually happens with something they put in a museum okay and so they freeze it in time and say he made this in 19 or whatever 20, 2020 um, and that's what creates the masterpiece you know oh we're supposed to like that because they say it's good it's a good it was a good thing uh, and all that of course works out just as it's kind of art world politics kind of stuff does that answer the question laurel Oh. In the pieces really comes in more in the selection of the materials than yeah. in your process in the studio. There is definitely an excess in these and and I mean I mean I've got dollar bills in there and funny people always said, Well, do you use dollar bills? Are those real dollar bills? And I said, They have to be real. I can't duplicate them. You realize it's against the law to do that. It's also against the law for me to put them on something like this because they're out of circulation. Unfortunately, I haven't ever been arrested. I think that would be really good publicity and might cause some sales, but you know, that's just the way it is. So these, these are about, you know, sort of, to me, a sort of a tactile, uh, ethereal world, but they're also about cold hard cash and by the way there's bible pages down there and uh you know all these other things that that are in our world today you know one in one way or another and so those voices from from something like a dollar bill or a bible page or a hawaiian shirt um obviously carries yeah its own subject matter and i am putting them in here like a blender and going okay there you go here's a bunch of it um, but i also really like the idea as i said of after it's in the blender tuning it so that it feels right and that's really something that i can't justify or explain i just said yeah that i like to say that one's right but that that one over there is not quite right yet you know uh, and I could work on that one a little bit more. I can't, don't think I could work on this one. I maybe give it a couple of years and I'd probably want to do something to it, but yeah, that kind of thing. I, yeah. I think it's, it's a celebration you know, of the contemporary arts to me because it's so well placed in, in what you found it. Mm -hmm. And then also for the viewers, we can take it as the way we experience in the life as well as the, you know, today's, the yeah. time and uh, the history yeah. of or whatever. And I think it's, uh, I think it's so uh, well said and the voice will be changing in time yeah. in, in a way. So I think uh, you, you did a very good job. Thank you, Chris. That's yeah. I like them to exist both as, you know, high art and as folk art. 
I can't be a folk artist, I'm not naive. <laughs> I am not that smart, but I'm not, but, I'm, but I can't say I don't have a Master of Fine Arts and I haven't taught in a college for 40 years. I mean, I, you know, I did. So I can't be a naive artist, but I love that kind of work. People that are inspired enough to do it, but have no uh, background. And so that's, they are an inspiration to me, those, those artists are, as well as, as, the, as the high end people too. And, uh, and people like you, so that's cool. <laughs> Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, I listened to your your Zoom talk and uh, what you started with talking about these pieces. I always found that art tells much more interesting stories about artists than artists tell about art. <laughs> yeah, usually. <laughs> yeah. So you started out mentioning that your first piece was um, you painted blue eyes on it. It's a self-portrait. Yeah. So you were identifying with the subject, right. right? Yes. And not the hunter, you were identifying with the hunter. Right. Uh, do you, what, what story did they tell about you? Well, I think this tells a story of me being in Hawaii. I mean, it takes a lot of money to be here. You know, you wear Hawaiian shirts when you're here. Uh, you get all mixed up with your friends and, you know, at least you were until this last year, you, you had lots of, you know, social things to do. And, um, but I mean, the, per the personification of yourself as the victim right. of the hunt, you start out with yourself as the subject, right? Mm -hmm. You were the first subject. So you are you're identified with the, the model, as it were. Yeah. Um, but I don't know if the hunt, I mean, yes, the, 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 the things I was uh, originally inspired by were taxidermist forms that had to do with the hunt, but these, these weren't hunted, you know, these were invented. Uh, and certainly they have animal parts in them, um, the leather and so forth, but they have all kinds of other parts too. Um, one of these days, I'm probably gonna have one that's got cell phones all over it, you know, <laughs> I mean, probably. But uh, I have to gather that stuff up. So they're, they're really more, uh, rather, rather than be saying indicative of the hunt, I think they're indicative of the world we live in. Uh, and not many of us hunt well, in that way. Well, they're self-portraits. Yeah. But, so you were identifying with them. Yes. As, so they're, are they all self-portraits? No, I don't see them as self-portraits. I mean, every work that an artist does is a self-portrait by some way or another. It just, you can't avoid it. Um, I, 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 uh, I see them more like music than I see them. I mean, I see them as visual arts, so I see them as much like music as I would portraits. You know, it's like writing a, a really good... Uh, rock and roll song and with a with a good underbeat with things going on and then things that you know in, uh, emphasize certain parts and things that repeat and and things like that i see them more that way i guess so ken i know you do uh, these animal pieces in bronze as well yeah and so they delete all the colors yeah Yeah. Worn by people and they keep our feet safe. I think it's all a concept all together in your pieces. Yeah. Um, well, the bronzes are really different than these because the bronzes are monocolor and uh, the bronzes don't have the understructure, this thing that's inside here, to hold it up. So it ends up being a three dimensional drawing in space, sort of like a gesture drawing, except it's, except it's in. Right, it's kept, exactly, except it's in, uh, in bronze belts and shoes and ties and things. Uh, and, uh, and consequently, that makes them about 40 times more expensive to make <laughs> than, than these. Uh, so I get to make a lot more of these than I do the bronzes. And if I was making a bronze, I wouldn't build it like this. 
I have a bunch of molds at my studio of shoes and I make wax shoes and wax belts. Then I build the whole thing in wax shoes and belts and then take it to a foundry and they take it off in pieces and cast it and then weld it back together so that it has this uh, negative shape of a pig inside. That's, that's the process of that. And that that's also makes the process really formal and long, you know, uh, uh, where this is much more fun. This is like a coloring book. It's like the coloring book I had when I was a kid. You get to do whatever you want. Right. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Well, if you look on my website and you look at the ceramics, I started as a potter uh, and went to doing low fire uh, ceramic work with plexiglass boxes and things like that. Actually, I started as, as this five-year-old kid painting China with my grandmother, Sis, which is the reason I started. And uh, then later on, as I was doing ceramic work, I would break up plates and stick them in the pieces. And it was exact, doing exactly what I was doing here, yeah, yeah. Except the, uh, there was not that I mean, with the ceramic piece, you got to do it and then fire it, and then do it and fire it, and fire it again, fire it again, fire it. But these, you just do it and it's done. And it's, it's easier and more flexible uh, creative process. But it's not a better one. You know, it's just, yeah. Thank you. I just want to say also that Ken is a musician. And ah, okay. Uh, Yeah. And ceramic. Uh, so we have a CD actually uh, also on the desk. Uh, and Ken is going to perform for us a few pieces. Depends how he feels. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.